Our first problem is definition. Joe asked us to deal with severe PIP joint contracture. So uh, I don't think that we came up to a common definition and some of the patients I see there would not describe as severe cases. So in my understanding, it would be a severe contracture greater than 90 degrees and maybe some other difficult cases who have both recurrence and contracture or strong diatesis and contracture. And uh, if we are to treat them, we need to face a number of important problems. We're gonna have to deal with the skin, we're gonna have to deal with the fascia, we're gonna have to deal with the joint, and then we want to look at our outcomes and of course our recurrence rate. So if we decide to go into surgery, well, uh, we know we're gonna be faced, or whatever, whatever treatment actually we're gonna use, we know we're gonna be faced with a shortage of skin when we try and extend this. So uh, it's been my experience that when the PIP joint contracture is isolated and no more than 90 degrees, we're quite safe. We can, we can go ahead and do local flaps I usually uh, perform VY flaps, and I've been pretty satisfied with that. Some would prefer rotation flap. I must say I don't have much experience. But when we get to this type of uh, cases, when we have MP and PIP contracture, and cases of recurrence where there's a lot of scarring, and, uh, uh, and those cases who obviously had some problems uh, of healing and do end up, is that it? How does that work? Pointer? Ah, okay, sorry. Uh, uh, obviously, there was some uh, skin healing problem here. Uh, we may want to do otherwise. And uh, also, and we'll discuss that later, uh, when patients have a strong athesis, and this is when skin grafts can be helpful. Uh, this is a strong diathesis, young patient, PIP contracture 95 degrees. And uh, you see the end result here after two years. And what is this? This is not a recurrence. This is PIP joint stiffness. And we'll talk about that also because this must be distinguished from contracture. Uh, there are complications to skin grafting. I think this is not a very easy technique. It requires a, a lot of uh, care, and uh, you can get uh, this uh, dreadful complication. This was not so great here, but in this other case, you see this is a severe Dupuytren's disease. It's been operated here, 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 and here. Uh, we had a large tear in, in uh, necrosis in the skin graft, so we performed a cross finger flap, and you see this less than ideal endpoint result. The patient is one of my happiest patients. Uh, so maybe, maybe Clay has a point there. However, there are great advantages to those skin grafts. It has been shown widely in the literature, then, uh, apart from a few examples, there is no recurrence on the graft. So uh, I enjoyed very much uh, Margot's presentation, you know, doing redo and redo and redo and redo and redo. How about a one-shot operation? You know you won't have to go back. And in those severe contractures of the digital part, this is exactly what you want. You don't want to go back because you know it's getting harder and harder. So I think that here, skin grafts do make a point because we have witnessed recurrence, but away from the graft. So if you graft the important area, which is basically the whole of the uh, proximal phalanx, I think we're pretty safe. This is a very uh, funny anecdotal case. This uh, was a, a Tubiana's patient, and Tubiana uh, corrected uh, the three digit, but did a tiny little fire break at the basis of the fourth finger. And I got to see the patient seven years later. It's just anecdotal, but I thought uh, it would be nice to show it to you. <coughs> so maybe I do have a point here. Very severe cases. Sometimes you don't want to go directly into surgery and uh, you want to do two-step procedures. And I have occasionally performed that. 
primary uh, fasciotomy at the palm level in order to extend the MP joint. And then it gets much easier because you don't have skin shortage, because uh, access to your cords is going to be much easier. This is uh, one case that was a very severe bilateral little finger involvement in a 45-year-old patient. So this is needle, and you see that we have uh, taken care of the MP joint contracture doing that needle fasciotomy. And uh, this is uh, the patient at, uh, I think he's almost at one year post-op. Of course, he is not perfect. He still has some PIP joint contracture. So far, I have not felt any recurring disease. It's just contracture. And in extremely severe cases, we have the well-known uh, external fixator technique. This was devised by uh, Messina initially with his tech, and then um, many other uh, devices have been done. Uh, Rajesh uh, in... Uh, 2000 uh, came out with their experience. I'm, I'm afraid I'm wrong here. I think this is 2010, I'm sorry. Uh, of 34 patients with a follow-up at 30 months, average correction was quite nice, and the flexion deficit was only 21 degrees. So you can get quite uh, satisfactory results. This is uh, one of my cases. This is what we've been uh, using. I don't think it matters. This is at the end of uh, passive extension. This is surgery. The, the cords are a little uh, different from, uh, from a, a normal cord and uh, a little diffuse, but uh, we still can get uh, quite satisfactory results with that. Now, second point is Dupuytren fascia. And I think that we forget a little bit about Dupuytren fascia in the finger, because not only do we have those nice central cord, but we also have those lateral cords, prevascular, laterovascular, retrovascular, we have spir spiraling, we have double spiraling. How can you, you deal with that with a simple needle, especially when it is so severe? And what you often have is this more than those very nice cords that you see on, on the drawings. And I feel like I need to visualize it and remove the tissue. Look at this, this is from Michael Tonkin. You know, your, your uh, vascular pedicle is at risk here. Ultrasound, uh, there have been a few, uh, uh, a few papers on that. Technically, on a very severely contracted finger, it's quite difficult to just put your, your ultrasound in there. And, and secondly, uh, and that's from uh, UERA, uh, there are some mesoechoic cords, so you won't, see, you won't uh, see them. Sensitivity is not so great, and they have not tried into observer rel reliability. And this is another problem, because we all know that ultrasound is not an easy technique. Little tips, if, you do, if you're doing surgery, remember if you're dealing with the second and fifth finger, that those uh, vascular pedicles may be very thin. So what you want to do when you're dealing with the second or fifth finger is first control and protect the contralateral artery, and then you're safe. Because if you do uh, hurt this one and then embark on dissecting the other one, you may have very, very uh, uh, big problems. So now we have to deal with the joint itself. And I don't know that there is on any other technique than surgery that can deal with the joint. And uh, we may need to incise the flexor sheath. Also, this may be a problem per se, because uh, even though we try and maintain the pulleys, we can have a large tear in the sheath. And if you want to apply a skin graft on that, then you're in trouble. So we need to create those little sheath advancement flap, and we need to, to uh, uh, pre, um, uh, um, program this. Uh, check reins, I think most people agree that check reins done very carefully, laterally, is quite a safe procedure. And what about the extensor apparatus in those very, very severe contractures? I haven't heard a word about that, and we do need to deal with them. In long-standing severe contractures, there is 
often a slackening. So we need to assess that per-operatively through the Tino disease test, and this is the type of, exactly the type of patient. He has a very severe contracture. We did get rid of Dupuytren's tissue. We did get rid of finger stiffness, but we did not get rid of the uh, extensor part slackening. So you need to assess this and you need to deal with it. How do we deal with it? Well, my preference is K-wiring. Some people do uh, tendon repair. I'm not so sure about that. So should we obtain complete PIP extension at all costs? Well, probably not. Some have done collateral ligaments, capsule, and there is this uh, very nice paper by the Lens Group that showed that even if you do uh, those procedures, it does not end up too much uh, uh, difference in the long term. So we should not obtain complete PIP extension at the expense of flexion and beware of arthritic joint. And I do agree with Clay that uh, these retired guys who want uh, uh, nothing in life but play golf, uh, they are extremely unhappy, and I have one particular patient who's been following me for years and years, and, and I'm not sure how to deal with him. Okay, another technical tip. We want to make sure that the finger vascularity is all right, so I like to release the tourniquet, look at the vascular status, look at our flaps, and of course perform a steady hemostasis. Post-op regimen, physiotherapy, early splinting in all cases of severe PIP contracture. These are the cases where I do it. I don't do it always, but in these cases I do it. And we need to work on flexion. This is, uh, this is a good result in extension, bad result in flexion. This is an early result, uh, two weeks after graft, and we are going to talk with the physiotherapist and the patient and, and obtain that. And this is uh, our uh, um, lack of flexion complication rate. This is our R series, and this is from the literature, 6%. And uh, this is saying pretty much the same thing. Okay, and we need to speak about a few other procedures. I don't think that the needle, uh, whether there is a syringe at the end of the needle, is going to, uh, to uh, take care of all, all problems. So we have a, a few things that can help us. The total t anterior tenoatholysis, uh, designed by French uh, colleagues, and which uh, basically shifts the range of motion towards something that's more functional. That can be helpful. Of course, we all know about PIP joint, usually shortening arthrodesis. And I just want to say a word about this nice little operation designed by one of my colleagues, Rimbaud. And uh, basically what he does is uh, remove middle phalanx and does an arthrodesis between proximal and distal phalanx. So that solves all the tension and you see quite uh, satisfactory results. This is one of his cases, and you see this severely contracted finger. This is the end result. It's a little shorter, but not that much. This is him here. And provided you have good MP joint, well, the result is quite satisfactory. Outcomes, we'll go very quick on that. We know that PIP joint correction is uh, significantly correlated to hand function, so we do need to work on that. And uh, we know that with fasciectomy, we usually have full correction of MP, almost full correction of PIP, but not always, and uh, that it usually depends on initial contracture, although Joe's uh, data did not show that, but this shows in other data and uh, that uh, there is some degree of recontracture. This is from Joe's work, but you still see that 81% of his patient had a very, very mild recontracture. We know all this data about results with needle, which are far from uh, uh, satisfactory at the MP level. We know uh, about Larry's result, uh, gain 29% in the PIP joint. Uh, this was a retrospective study two years ago showing that there was not much difference between uh, needle and collagenase as respect uh, to either MP or PIP joint. And uh, so I'm still, you know, gaining here a little bit of uh, confidence. How about recurrence? Uh, this is a meta-analysis by Crenn 2011, and uh, for some reason, 
his, there was a star here and Crane's results should, should appear. Oh, here it comes. And you see, and you see after needle, and you see after fasciectomy. So uh, it seems from the literature that the result is uh, less after uh, fasciectomy. So this is uh, other data. You all know about this data, recurrence delay. Uh, how about fasciectomy? We thought that the recurrence uh, occurred early, but uh, long-term results have shown that they keep, that they keep growing although at a less steady pace. And from the literature, we all know that there is hardly any recurrence under grafts. And this uh, was apparent in my series. Uh, we had 34 patients, 41 uh, dermofasciectomy, average for 5.6 years. And uh, dermofasciectomies recurred only in 21%, whereas uh, the rest of the series had a much higher rate of recurrence. So it seems that the screen grass protects the digit from recurrence. It has a protective uh, effect. Uh, this is a patient, uh, 65 years, three previous surgery. We worked on the right hand, did the large screen graft, worked on the left hand twice, and this is him at seven years follow-up. He had no recurrence of ever after that. He has very nice flexion. He is a retired uh, farmer and enjoys drinking wine and shooting games. Uh, this is the data for collagenase. We've heard all, all that before. So uh, as a summary, we have skin shortage. Do you prefer skin augmentation with a nice graft or flap or blood all over the ceiling, as somebody mentioned earlier. Correction of deformity, we have seen that fasciectomy does the best correction over all other procedures. Postoperative treatment, we treat them the same. Recurrence, we've seen that obviously fasciectomy and on top of it, dermofasciectomy is superior to all techniques. And of course, I think I have a big point here. And of course, France won that particular game. <laughs>